Right. So this is a workshop, digital workshop, virtual workshop on position papers, part one. And we'll talk about exactly what part one means in just a moment. Uh, my name is Tori Tier. I work for the Writing Center here at Southern Seminary. I work in the office on Mondays and I work online um, the rest of the week. Before we get started, I wanna go ahead and show you some of the things that are available to you. So where to begin? Where to begin when you begin uh, this project, the research paper, or excuse me, the position paper, and where, where would you begin to start any project for Southern Seminary? And so first is uh, resources, and I'll show you all of these resources that we have available to you. The rubric specifically for the position paper, as well as an outline that corresponds to the rubric. And then this is a note, both for me and for you. Anything that I say in this workshop is uh, following a standardized format. If anything that I say differs from what your professor says or asks of you, or, or even his or her preference, um, if the syllabus says something different than what I am um, guiding you towards, it should be pretty consistent across the board, pretty consistent overlap. But if there's specific things that your professor is asking for that differs from anything that I say, always follow your professor's instructions. So I'll use ours as kind of the standardized format and then use your uh, professor's specifics and preferences. Preferences are very important. So as far as resources, let me show you what is available to you, um, both as in-person, if you're around, or if you come for a modular uh, intensive, or um, if you're online at any, at any moment. So the first is you can submit your papers, which I'm sure you're aware, but you can actually submit your papers to be reviewed by a writing expert. I am one of them. And if you scroll down to the bottom, you'll see a list of everyone in their bios. You can even request a writing expert if you've worked with someone. But do uh, please give us at least two to three days to review your paper. In other words, if your paper is due today at midnight, um, please don't send it to us too, uh, on today or else we probably won't get to it. But if you do give us two to three days, uh, we really try our best to get it back to you as soon as possible. And in line with that, when you submit your paper, uh, you can submit up to one paper a week. So today is Monday at 1 p.m. If you submitted a paper right now, we ask that you please wait until next Monday to submit another one. Now you can submit a paper, let's say you submit it today and we don't get it back to you until Wednesday. You could still submit a new paper or if, if the deadline for this paper is far out, you can submit the same paper um, over and over again as long as you follow the one, uh, one paper a week rule. And in, in line with that, we, get, we are allotted about one hour per paper. And so we, we, um, we look at as much as we can in that hour, and it's your hour. So let me show you what you can do to get the best of your hour. Here you could uh, copy and paste your syllabus. You can type in some brief descriptions, but especially here, you can tell us, uh, please focus on grammar and syntax. You know, I have, I'm a pastor. I haven't, I haven't uh, been in, in school for 15 years. Uh, my writing is is rusty. I'd love uh, feedback on grammar and syntax. You could say, I feel pretty decent about my grammar and syntax. Please focus on footnote citations, bibliography citations. You could say, please help me with formatting. I have no idea what I'm doing. You can even ask us specific questions. Hey, you know, look at everything as you can, but please make sure to um, address these one, two, three, four, however many uh, questions. And that way you get the most of your hour and we'll actually get this. So that's how you can get help online. You can also schedule an appointment. Uh, we set this up for our office hours. You click 30 or 60 minute meetings, you can uh, schedule a meeting in person with one of our writing experts who works in the office Monday through Friday. And you can even, you know, just like we're doing now with Zoom, you can schedule that, you can detail that out when you select here. You can schedule that as a Zoom meeting, as a phone call, as a video chat, whatever you'd like to do. Um, but we are available to you even at a distance. And finally, uh, specifically resources. This is our Writing Center webpage. We have all kinds of resources available to you. If you were to start your position paper, the best thing to do is to download the research paper template. We also have the book review template, but anything that's not a book review or your dissertation or thesis, if you're doing that, um, use the research paper template. There's instructions built into the template to help you have a perfectly formatted uh, position paper. And I'll show you that in our example. There's also other things that are helpful for you, like the citation guide. This is a condensed version of Turabian, 
which is the style that we use. Turavian is a subset of Chicago. You don't have to worry about that. But we try to give you the most common citation forms, both in footnote form and in bibliography form. So use this as you're doing your position papers and research papers. There's also the manual style, which was recently updated over the summer. And so this is um, anything that Chicago, Turabian doesn't mention. The style, the manual style covers a, a wide range of uh, formatting style um, and assignment requirement issues. There's all kinds of stuff in there. Uh, my recommendation is you use, you go to this manual style with your, with the right question. So, hey, do I write this number out or do I use, do I use Arabic numbers or do I use uh, Roman numerals or ask the style manual question, go to the table of contents and it will direct you to the right section and so on and so forth. There's so many more resources here. Sample theology papers, these are position paper examples that are annotated. Here is an example of what I'm directing you to. It has comments, the yellow means it's okay, could be better. The green means it's great, do that. And red means please avoid doing that. So on this tab, there are three such papers and I believe they are like terrible, decent and really great. So you have all kinds of examples at your disposal. We'll be taking a look at this position paper example here in a moment. So that should conclude all the resources that are available to you. We have videos, just, I recommend you just tour this webpage. So let's jump right in to our actual position paper. We're covering part one of the position paper. So, and this may differ per class, but the way I believe it's uh, standardized is that you complete part one, you turn it in to your professor, you get a grade and feedback. And I think you also evaluate yourself and then the grader evaluates you, gives you feedback. You improve your part one in, in accordance with that feedback. And then later on in the semester, you submit part, the revised part one and the new part two together. So we're focusing on part one only today and we'll make a future workshop and record it for part two. So part one has uh, two sections. Now, it was a little bit confusing when I taught this live. I described there being five sections. So introduction, section one, section two, section three, and conclusion. And I would say we're gonna be covering sections one and two. It's very confusing. So for this one, I'm just gonna say we're gonna have two aspects of part one, the introduction and section one, alternative views. That's what we're gonna be focusing on today. So in the introduction, there's three components. And I actually give a very comprehensive workshop only on introductions and conclusions. So what you're getting is a subset of a much bigger, much more comprehensive uh, workshop that covers introductions and conclusions. You're just getting the introduction. Part two, of a position paper workshop will cover the conclusion aspect. So there's three major components of an introduction section. I'm giving you the skeleton. So there can be, you can add a little bit more, but, as, but you need to have these three components. Um, some people will say, well, that doesn't sound very creative or doesn't allow me to be creative. And I completely understand. But if you, you have to master the three basic components first, and once, you've, once you feel comfortable with that, once you've mastered it, then you can start playing with it in creative ways. But in my experience as a writing expert, reviewing lots and lots of papers, uh, most students have uh, trouble with including these three um, elements. If they do include them, they are not always clear. And so what I want to uh, recommend is that you focus on getting these three in there as clear as possible. And always think about, um, who you're writing this for. You're writing this for your professor, you're writing this for your grader. And if it takes being less creative to be more clear, you wanna make sure that you're signaling that you have all the components so that they can give you the appropriate grade. So without further ado, three components are, as you can see on the screen, a brief orientation of subject, we'll get to that in a moment, a thesis statement, that's your argument, not what the paper is about generally, but what you are going to argue, it's the most important part of your entire position paper and a methodology statement. That is a summary of the major steps that you're gonna get into uh, throughout the paper. So it's kind of an outline in advance. So let's go to a, our example. We'll actually look at this first. So brief orientation of subject, that's where you introduce the issue at hand. Our example is gonna be sanctification. So you want to introduce the subject of sanctification as a doctrinal area, and that's very broad. So just 
ease the reader into the subject matter. We're going to be talking about, I don't know if write it that way, uh, the, the systematic locus of sanctification. And as you get, as you add more sentences and get closer and closer to revealing your thesis statement, you want to go from general to more specific. So you introduce your subject and you start discussing some of the issues that might be involved. If there's something contentious, something that's debated between two sides, uh, for example, if you're going to introduce the subject of baptism, you might, you know, you would introduce it, and then you would say, hey, there's a believer's baptism, there's infant baptism. This has been contested for several centuries, really, uh, over a millennia. And so you would slowly start to add sentences to make your topic, your argument more clear. And then when you offer your thesis statement, it's immediately clear to your reader how the subject and the issues at hand relate to your thesis statement. In other words, when you give your thesis statement, they know exactly why it matters. And here, here is the recommended structure. In this paper, I will argue that blank. You don't have to write it just like this. Blank view is the most biblically, theologically, and historically viable. This is just a skeleton. You also don't have to write in first person. I would ask your professor. It used to be that first person was discouraged. Um, now it's generally um, positive. I use it all the time as a doctoral student here at Southern, and I've, I've gotten no negative feedback. It just depends on professors. Some professors prefer third person. So you would say in this paper, it will be argued that. That's passive voice, but if you have to do that, that's okay. You can also say this paper will argue that. And again, I, I recommend this perhaps skeletal structure as a symbol. You are signaling to your reader, hey, I'm about to give you my thesis statement. That way you can see it and give me the correct grade. If they can't find it, it's gonna be difficult for them to assess you um, accurately and quickly, really quickly, because they have a lot of papers to grade. So the, the blank is what your argument is. In the paper that we're gonna look at, she's gonna argue that the reformed view of sanctification is the most biblically, theologically, and historically viable. Of course, you don't have to say it just that way, but that's essentially what you're arguing in a position paper. And your methodology statement is going to, you're going to have three steps. Now for a position paper, this is almost always going to be the same. Check your syllabus, but there's three steps. There's three sections. First, you're going to articulate and critique. Well, actually this is um, outdated. Uh, let me, we're not going to critique. We're just going to articulate or summarize the various alternative views. Um, Section one, that's what we're going to talk about today. Introductions, section one. Uh, let me mute all of our participants briefly. There we go. Um, we're going to be talking about introduction and section one, which is alternative views. Number two, section two is going to be articulating and supporting your own position on the subject. And your final section, section three, will be responding to common objections to your position. This is the standardized format for a position paper. And so your methodology statement should really be the same for most of your, um, you have a question. Is this PDF available for us? Oh, thanks for asking. Yes, I'm gonna hopefully, um, well, if I get everyone's email address, then I will send out all the resources that you see on the screen. I'm gonna send them out in a follow-up email. Um, so what, what that might look like is um, you typing in your email address into this chat box. Or, or something, there's probably a better way to do that. But um, at the very least, if you give me your email, then I will send this to you, send all these resource, resources to you. Thanks for asking. So, like I said, um, a position paper is a standardized across the ST realm. And so your, your three steps should really be the same. You could say them a little differently, but they're still gonna be the same three steps. Um, let's check our chat one more time. Let's see what we have here. Great. Yeah, here's my email address. This is probably a little dangerous. Um, there we go. Hopefully that works. Um, do use that to get these resources, but please don't use that to uh, bombard me with emails. Um, not because I don't want to help you. I absolutely do, but it's very difficult for me to manage everyone's requests. So please try to limit that, that email to just this workshop. Anyway, so uh, that's the three steps of the introduction. Brief orientation subject, thesis statement, give me your argument, 
and methodology statement summarize the rest of the paper. So let's look at an example. This is, by the way, a Southern paper. I've changed names and all that. Um, I'm not sure why there's annotations there. It is a completed paper for a real class and it got an A. I believe it got a 95 or a 96 or a 97, but it's an A paper. There's a couple places it could be better, but it's, it's what you want to do. It's what you want to strive for. I always find it helpful if I know what an A is, I know what I'm shooting for. And if I, you know, because of life circumstances or ability, I know what's, if I produce something that's less than an A, I at least know how to compare it uh, to an A paper. So this is a really great introduction. It's very simple. You'll notice it's just two paragraphs and it's about half a page because the, you're losing two inches up here. The first paragraph is the brief orientation to subject. So out of our, um, out of our three components, this is component number one. Let's see if my uh, annotations work. So this whole paragraph is component number two, or number one, excuse me. Let's just go ahead and read it um, so that we get a good sense of what's going on. Evangelicals hold tightly to the promise in 2 Corinthians 5, 17 through 21, that as a result of their justification in Christ, they are new creations. Holiness is a key characteristic of this new life. So she's introducing the topic of holiness, perhaps as it relates to 2 Corinthians and the result of justification. It's great. Holiness is a key characteristic of this new life. Yet, so there's something going on. She's, she's kind of cluing us into maybe a debate. Yet, Scripture also exhorts Christians to be holy while living in a fallen world. Thus, Christians must consider to what degree living a sanctified, sanctified sanctification, sanctified life is possible and how it is achievable. There is considerable deb debate. That's great. She's cluing in that there's a debate, which is why you're doing a position paper, because there's multiple views, right? There is considerable debate about among evangelicals. She's also limiting her views that she's going to consider, not to evangelicals, non-evangelical, Roman Catholic, uh, Greek Orthodox, just ev within evangelicalism, as to the definition and practical implications of sanctification. Though a theologically complex and arduous task, analysis of a biblical understanding of sanctification is vital, for it establishes how Christians should live to honor God. It's a really great brief, and I love that it's so brief, um, introduction to the, to the topic of, uh, yes, I'll send you the, the recorded video. Thanks, Gary. So it, I love that it's brief because it gets you to the topic and to the thesis as quick as possible because, again, check with your professor, but a position paper should be, in total, 10 pages. It might be 10 and a quarter, it might be nine and three quarters, but it should be 10 pages. And so you really need to be as brief as possible, which means getting in and out of your introduction as fast as you can. So this brief four to five sentence introduction is great. So now we move into um, segment number two and notice the student includes the signaling, the thesis signaling. So here she is letting us know that she's going to number two. In this paper, I will argue that, and whatever comes after that is the argument, that the reformed portrayal of sanctification most accurately aligns with scripture. And then here, she is indicating the why or the most important reasons, which I'll get to in a, in a moment. It's very important for a position paper, not always for research papers, but for a position paper, surely. So here's the why. Uh, most accurately aligned with scripture concerning the mutual significance of Christ's work on the cross and the outworking union with Christ through the mutual or through the transforming power of the Holy Spirit. So let me take a, a break for a moment and show you two things. First is the theological uh, writing rubric, which will pop up in a minute again. But if we zoom in on the thesis statement here, this should be the one that your professor has uh, you evaluate yourself with. It says students should include a clear and concise thesis statement that controls the content. So I've, I've showed you that. And controls the content is very important. Every single thing in your paper that doesn't contribute, support, point back to, or advance your thesis is essentially irrelevant. Not that it's not important in real life, but because you give your thesis, everything that follows has to align with your thesis. It's kind of your guiding principle. But here's the second part, very important. It should include the student's position. For example, sanctification is, uh, the reformed view of sanctification is the best, as well as 
the major supporting points for that position. So let's go back to our example. She doesn't say it in so many words that these are her major supporting points, but she's indicating, and this might be a, an area where she could be more clear, and maybe you could be more clear in your position paper. But here she's indicating the major areas of, of, of how she will support her thesis. Now you might want, you might want to say, um, I will argue that the reform for trial sanctification most accurately aligns with scripture for the following reasons, or for three reasons. And those three reasons could be two, could be four. You know, again, you have to be controlled because your your position paper is limited in space. Um, for the following reasons, for three reasons, and then you would give a a three sentence. Let's just say there's three reasons. We give a three sentence summary. First, blah blah blah. This is the first major reason. Second, and, and I, again, be as brief as you possibly can, because you have an entire section of your paper to discussing supporting and advancing those three points. So just give us a highlight. This, the, this view is the best biblically, theologically, historically for three reasons. One, two, three. In order to accomplish this task, and then you move on, right? So here we get to the next signal. In order to accomplish this task, I will first, or I will. This, it, this is where the student is letting us know that she's shifting from thesis to methodology which is component number three. Again, you might want to be more creative, that's fine. I like this as a grader because I, I see component one, I see this line and I know that's the thesis. So I'm gonna go and evaluate the thesis according to the rubric and I'm gonna assign you a grade. And then I'm gonna keep reading and I'm gonna see in order to accomplish this task, this project, this purpose. And I'm gonna, this signals to me that, sh that the student is gonna outline the rest of the paper. So, and again, this should be, this should correspond for most position papers. Section one, examine prominent evangelical perspectives concerning sanctification. And a very brief summary. So she doesn't even tell us what the views are, she just tells us the name of them. Lutheran, Wesleyan, Pentecostal. That's section one, we're gonna talk about that for the rest of our time. And this, from here forward, is part two of the position paper. Section two, I will analyze the reform view under the authority of scripture to substantiate how, in contrast to the alternative positions, its understanding of holiness is more biblically faithful and theologically sound. So that's, that's gonna be her major section where she's defending her own view. Finally, section three, I will present and rebut two major objections. That's section three. And so we'll just briefly scan before we go back to our PowerPoint. This is section one, dominant evangelical perspectives. Notice she has just a, a broad title, and she gives us subtitles or second level subheadings to differentiate the three views. So here's a brief introduction. Here's section, subsection one, view number one. Subsection two, view number two, Wesleyan. And subsection three, uh, view number three, which is Pentecostal. Her, her view does not appear. This would, this would indicate she's moving to section two, which is Part two, we won't get there, so we'll just put a break right there. So let's go back to our PowerPoint and uh, we'll continue. So that should be good for introductions. If you have any questions, pop them in here for introductions. Um, let's move on. So some, some students might ask, what's the difference between a position paper and a research paper? They are very similar, but they have distinct goals. So a position paper, as I've showed you with the methodology, has three specific sections. This should be clear. A research paper has a variable sections. Maybe in your research project, you have two major points that you want to articulate and defend. Maybe it's three, maybe it's four. Um, that's okay. It depends on what the research project is, what the scope is and what the needs are. But for a position paper, again, it's standardized across systematic theology classes, three sections. Position paper is a state and defend paper. You are stating your position, and you are defending it. You could also say it's a summary, defend, respond paper. You summarize the alternative views, you defend your own view, and then you respond to objections to your view. Whereas a research paper is an argue, advance, defend paper. You give your thesis statement, so it's very similar to a position paper. They both have thesis statements or arguments, but in a research paper, you're going to argue and advance and defend your thesis. You don't necessarily have to 
summarize alternative views. Now, it might it might come up that you do if it's relevant for your for your uh, research project, but you'll have a very specific thesis statement. For example, I would argue that a proper understanding of the Holy Spirit is that his person and work are Christological or Christocentric in emphasis. That's a thesis statement. And I'd have to prove that in a number of ways throughout my uh, paper. So you would have uh, different sections and then you're really focusing on different things. Next, position paper. It's a ex there's two components. It's an exercise and it's a, an assessment. An exercise is that by you doing the position paper, you are learning. You are, the professor is assigning you an exercise in knowledge acquisition. You're not meant to be an expert, but it's meant to get you into the texts, into the primary and secondary sources, to get you, as you are researching and reading and articulating your ideas, outlining, putting pen to paper, uh, fingers to keys, you are learning in that exercise. And then by, by giving a finished product, you're gonna be assessed. You assess yourself with the rubric and then you are assessed or evaluated by your grader or professor. And that assessment help, challenges you, gives you feedback, and helps you become a better student. So it's, it's very directed. It's an exercise and assessment. The purpose of a research paper is to research, to synthesize your ideas, to organize and to persuade. Now, to a certain degree, you are doing that in a position paper. But again, a position paper is very directed. It's a very directed exercise. And again, position paper is broad in scope. I put an asterisk because it's broad in scope to the degree that you have space to talk about different views. A research paper is narrow in scope where you're focusing specifically on your subject at hand. Now, you might broaden it out, but since you're gonna be focusing on one thing, you would probably include a brief mention or a footnote or some kind of acknowledgement. Yes, there's more going on here, um, see these resources for more information, but I have to focus on this track. Whereas a position paper, um, by definition, with the three sections is broad. You're looking at various views and you're, um, you're interacting with them while you're also defending your own. So those are the differences. Hopefully that's helpful to you. Let's move on to section one, where you're, where you're summarizing alternative positions. You can call it whatever you want. This student says dominant evangelical perspectives. You might say various positions. Uh, you know, sometimes people might talk about what's the difference between evangelicalism and Roman Catholicism and either an orthodoxism or whatever. So you can title this however you want, but this is the section we're talking about. Two to four positions, skip your own view. And I put an asterisk here because sometimes your professor might ask you to include your position if they don't say so, if they don't say yes or no, if it's not explicitly articulated, I recommend that you skip it. And the reason why is because if you skip your own view, you can, you'll have more space to summarize either more views or less views, but more comprehensively. So you're giving yourself more space. The other reason why I recommend that you skip your own view, if your professor lets you, is you have an entire section dedicated to articulating and defending that view. So you can actually have a more robust section one, alternative positions, and a more robust section two, your position, if you skip your own view. But if your professor requires you to summarize your view in section one, I recommend that you summarize it as briefly as possible because you're going to defend it no matter what the specifics of your professor's preferences are, you're still going to defend your view, biblically, theologically, and historically. And, and while we're on the subject, you might ask, what does historically mean? Well, historically just means how is this, how is this view supported throughout history? So you could, it's really a subset of theological in that you're looking at theologians throughout history and seeing what they say. So you want to support your view primarily biblically. Theologically is the is the theological abstraction that's taken from the text and more generalized and does not uh, contradict the text. And historical would be including historical theologians uh, contributions to the subject. And in some cases you might include philosophical support, but it would depend on what your subject is. For example, um, the sovereignty of God and human freedom, you know, you would talk about some philosophical issues maybe the uh, problem of evil, you would, you would include philosophical support. But anyway, you support your position um, in section two. 
So it is about four pages. You'll see the yellow, four pages. Um, you have two parts to your position paper. Part one, introduction and section one, are five pages total. Um, I, I served as a grader for Greg Allison, Dr. Allison, for ST3, and he required students to write a, you could not go above 5.25 or five and a quarter pages. He explicitly states, my grader will stop reading after five and a quarter. So it, from about four and three quarters to five and a quarter, that should be how long your part one is. So if you make um, your introduction about half a page, again, you don't really have a lot of space because of your, you're missing the gap here. But if you make about half a page, just like this, it's perfect for an introduction. And then you make your section one about four pages, you should be in good shape. And really, if you're at about five and a half, you're fine, but if you're getting close to six, you really need to cut down. The goal is really to be as, as concise as possible. The other important thing is to summarize, not evaluate. Again, if your professor asks you to, to evaluate, then you should, of course, but really you're just trying to summarize the alternative views to indicate to the professor or grader that you know what you're talking about, um, that you have interacted with the correct sources and you know what their view is and you know it fairly. So that brings up a really important point, is that when you are doing the summary of the alternative views, you don't want to summarize them. Let's, let's say, well, let's take our example. Let's take a look at it. We have three views, Lutheran, uh, Pentecostal, and Wesleyan. When you summarize this, you don't want to summarize this from a Reformed perspective. That's the one that she's going with, Reformed. This should not read as a Reformed person talking about Lutheranism. It should read as a uh, Lutheran talking about Lutheranism. So you really want to make this sound like um, if someone was a Lutheran and they read this, they would say, that's exactly how I would describe it. That's amazing. Um, this is very important long-term for your growth because you want to be able to uh, articulate alternative positions charitably. It's very difficult to argue seriously for your own position if you actually don't understand the alternative one. If you're, if you're debating someone um, verbally, or if you're debating someone in a text, in a research paper, um, you're gonna be marked down if you have created straw man, it's called straw man positions. You erect a position that's not accurate of the true position, and then you attack it, but you're attacking a false position. So you really wanna describe this in the words of a Lutheran. You wanna describe or summarize the Wesleyan view in the words of a Wesleyan. Which brings up our last point, which is primary versus secondary sources. So a lot of students will go to Grudem, Wayne Grudem's Systematic Theology, which is a great source, but it's a secondary source, unless Grudem is supporting his own position, which I believe is generally reformed, then you would only use him as a primary source for reformed views. But you don't want to take Wayne Grudem's word for the Lutheran perspective. Now it can be true that alternative peop that people who don't hold the view can actually summarize alternative views really well. And that's what we're trying to challenge you to do with the position paper. We want you to be able to summarize alternative positions well. However, in this assignment, we want you to be able to do that using their own words. What that means is you need to go from secondary sources, which would be Grudem or maybe uh, Greg Allison's historical theology. They are talking about different kinds of views held by different people. So you, would use, you, you might consult those in the beginning of your research to get an idea of what the views are, what are the subjects, what are the issues, what are the debates, what's contended. And then you would see in their footnotes and their discussion, they're interacting with primary sources. So it's your job to go follow up with those primary sources. So let's take a look at our paper. Notice, and this is a great recommendation for you, five views on sanctification, forgive my crooked drawing, this is a five views book on the subject of sanctification. There's, these are a great series. I recommend them strongly for position papers. Five views on sanctification, three views on hell, five views on the uh, authority of scripture, or inspiration of scripture. Each chapter is written by a different person who holds a different view. And notice she's citing for the Lutheran view, she's citing the Lutheran chapter. So she's citing, she's describing Lutheranism in the words of a Lutheran. And that's exactly what you want. That's exactly what you want. Um, Martin Luther, not every person who corresponds to the name is going to be perfect, a perfect representation. Uh, for example, people will cite John Calvin to support Calvinism. 
um, precisions. Uh, but Calvinism as a uh, framework for doing theology really developed after him. It was systematized by later uh, followers. And so you have to be careful, but it is a good idea to go to those primary sources. And notice she's, she found Luther in the Lutheran chapter. So you have to, this takes a degree of discernment on uh, should you go to Luther's lettered Romans and look at the greater context? You might need to if necessary, but perhaps there's enough context in the quotation that it does support your point. And this Lutheran is using Martin Luther to support the Lutheran view, so you're probably safe here. But again, it does take some discernment. If we scroll down to the Wesleyan view, we'll see that there's um, an article on sanctification from Concordia Journal. This is a Wesleyan journal, so that's great. It's a great uh, primary source. And again, as the greater, I'm thinking, okay, if I see Grudem, 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 I'm going to know you haven't gone to primary sources. Now, um, if you say, uh, Gerald Ford says, you say that here in the text, just like this, and then you cite um, Donald Alexander, editor, in this book, I'm going to know that you, you went to the view, but you didn't cite him properly, so you lose a little bit of credibility. You need to cite the author and the chapter. But I'm going to be looking at your sources. Oh, Concordia, this corresponds to the Wesleyan position. That's great. Okay, the student looked at the Wesleyan chapter in describing the Wesleyan position. Excellent. Entire sanctification is a very distinct doctrine of Wesleyanism. So very good. Um, still in the world of Wesleyanism. If we scroll down to Pentecostal perception, we would see the Pentecostal chapter in the edited volume. Um, let's see if there's more. So here's Wayne Grudem. So perhaps here he's stating, you have to take a look at it. So here she shifted to the reform view, and now she's using Wayne Grudem as a primary source. Very good. I think you get the idea. You want to make sure you are summarizing the position as if you held the position or from inside internally. And that's how you, that's the difference between primary and secondary sources. I get a lot of questions about that. Um, we are at about the 40 minute mark. So I'm going to turn it over to questions. You can type them in here in the chat, or you can unmute yourself, ask the question and then mute yourself again. But I'll take, uh, I'll take questions until, until two. And then if, if it gets awkward and you guys don't ask me questions, I, I can come up with some based on um, questions I received in the past. So it's all yours. Um, I have a question. I, uh, I'm working on a paper. Can you hear me? I'm kind of new at this. You can. I can hear you very clearly, so thank you. Okay. I'm working on a paper um, trying to argue for the continuation of dreams and visions. Okay. I, I tried to incorporate um, kind of something more modern into the paper, so I started with a, uh, <clears throat> a reference to a an actual blog, which John MacArthur had made a statement. And then I, uh, he did, the guy who corrected my paper, he didn't say not to use it at all, but he did want me to interact with more academic sources, which I understand. And I was gonna do that later in the paper a little bit, but uh, what I'm wondering, my question is this, can I leave that in there, or should I just take it out completely, the reference to the blog? Did you, you, did you do that in the introduction? Uh, no. Uh, um, well, uh, actually, let me see. Uh, no, it was directly, it wasn't. Um, well, actually, I take that back. Hang on. It was a reference to um, an article on the, in the Gospel Coalition page. To, Muslims having dreams and visions, and that was in the intro. Okay, yeah. So it does. You do have to be really careful, and I understand the concern. You you typically want to steer away from blogs. Um, however, there are blogs written by people who write the textbooks. Um, so, for example, Fred Sanders is a very very well known Trinitarian scholar, and his blog on Trinitarianism is incredible. It's, it's uh, fully cited as a, as a book would be, and so it's an authoritative source. So it takes a little bit of discernment. Um, also relevancy, it sounds like what you're citing is relevant. So here's, here's my recommendation officially. 
use the blog if it maybe introduces the uh, concept or introduces a point of discussion. Um, maybe secondarily use it with caution to support a point that you have already made very clearly, both yourself and with more concrete sources. So don't depend on it is my, is my advice. Right. Um, I would say if you're using it well and using it wisely, everyone knows John MacArthur. And if he's speaking on a subject that he is known for being uh, authoritative on, so you, know, you wouldn't, um, what's, what's a good, so Steve Wellam is a, is a Christology expert. You wouldn't really want to cite Steve Wellam for something that's outside of his strengths. Um, and so you'd have to just know MacArthur. So just be careful. Don't, don't hinge your argument on it. Maybe use it more for introductory purposes or um, secondary support, but not primary support. Is that helpful? I didn't hear a response, so I'll move on to the next one. Um, I will be sharing the presentation at Tito. Um, if you type your email here, then I will email you the presentation and the video or the video of the presentation along with additional sources. But here's a question that I got. Could you explain how, I'm guessing, how SBTS can help to obtain source materials? So this is great. I'm glad you brought it up because this was brought up in the live workshop. Um, the multi-views are always great sources to um, to go to to find alternative views. Uh, I'll, I'll address the incoming questions in just a moment. Another amazing series, uh, well, second, second, if you go to your typical systematic theologies like Millard Erickson or Wayne Grudem, most people know Wayne Grudem, um, Greg Allison's historical theology, any of those broad level systematic theologies, historical theologies, they're gonna be interacting with a bunch of sources and you can, yeah, go. You could find the the primary sources by going to those broad level sources. Another great one is um, is this particular series. I'm going to show you this in a second. Um, of course, if I could spell correctly, um, there we go. So Dr. Allison has written a incredible book on the doctrine of the church. So if you're doing ecclesiology position paper, you might go to this book to find different views on ecclesiology. Uh, so this is specifically for the doctrine of the church. Now, this is a series. Let's see if I can zoom in for you. <clears throat> this is a series called Foundations of Evangelical Theology. It's an incredible series. And there's books on different uh, foundations of evangelical theology. Very reputable uh, series. And you'll notice if you go to this uh, preview, you can see the cross and salvation. This is a book on soteriology. So if you're doing anything that's related to salvation, you can look up this book. It will be a great primary source and uh, for certain views and then a secondary source for alternative views. He Who Gives Life is a book on the Holy Spirit. No One Like Him is on the doctrine of God. So everything related to the doctrine of God, probably providence, um, creation, um, the, the omni abilities, uh, how God relates to creation. And to know and love God, I believe, is the theological method. So this is a great series. Um, let me, I think someone unmuted themselves. One moment, let me look up these briefly, these questions. Okay, so we're getting emails. Great. So yes, these are great resources to find. Um, here's even another, another series, Contours of Christian Theology. This, one's, this is older, more outdated. But again, these are great resources to um to get started let me show you the um five views series let's just go to biblical inerrancy if you go to the preview of this series they almost always look like this uh, with different colors um there's all there's tons of books divine providence but if you go to the preview there's like 20 of them and so this is a great uh, method to use to find sources let's take a look at our chat one more time Okay. Any other questions on position papers, part one and part two? I'll take verbal or textual questions. I'll be thinking of my own while I wait. Um, this was a question that was posed to me last week. A student asked me, are you allowed to disagree or are you allowed to de defend a view that your professor doesn't hold to? Now, my answer then was a lot more awkward because I was trying to make sure that I uh, 
was very careful what I said and to to not offend or to not deter from the institution. You do attend a Baptist institution. Uh, there are certain Baptist distinctives that you should attend to, um, but no one, but you're not expected to be 100% Baptist on every category. Um, there is a basic Orthodox confession that if you really don't hold to that, you know, like the Nicene Creed, for example, there's something wrong with your theology. But there's beyond that, most things are convictions or distinctives. And you should be sensitive to those distinctives, but you should really feel the liberty to um, expand. And, and really, again, think of the position paper as a critical uh, exercise. It's not so much that they want you to articulate the position that your professor agrees with. They want you to defend a position well. And so, for example, if you were defending uh, different views on eschatology. Um, I, I'm generally predisposed to premillennial uh, premillennialism, and if you don't know what that is, don't worry about it. You don't have to. Unless you're an ST3, then you'll be learning about um, esch esch eschatological views. But if I was a grader, and I have been, and someone was defending an amillennialist position, I have no problem with that. In fact, I'm excited, and I want to see how well you defend that position. If you defend the amillennial position well, then I'm, I'm very satisfied and I, I can see that you have thought through the issue critically. Almost all the positions that you're gonna be summarizing and defending are historical positions, which means that they are there's multiple views that have enough biblical substance that they haven't gone away. They haven't been disproved necessarily. People still hold to those views. So if you can defend your view well, and I can defend my view well, we can talk about it and we're doing a great job. So I would say feel the liberty to disagree with your professor, um, but do so respectfully. Again, charitably summarize the alternative views well and fairly. And then when you defend your own view, which may or may not agree with your professor, then you wanna make sure you give the best defense possible. And I think if you do that, you can have a great conscience. So let's take, let's see what kind of question we get here. Again, feel free to give me any verbal questions. I, I do have a question. Go ahead, Jake. Uh, on, on my paper, um, is it possible to, in your own view, kind of nuance the, uh, for instance, um, you know, the main arguments, it's hard to find material on just dreams and visions alone in mm. my, so far, but you can find a lot of stuff about prophecy or sure. situation and cessation of gifts, you know. And so is it possible to to kind of nuance your own um, biblical perspective there. Like, for instance, some, some cessationists hold to the function of the gifts continuing uh, into dreams and visions that God may interact with people through dreams, but they wouldn't necessarily say that, you know, there should be prophets in the church. Mm. Is that at all making sense? It is, yes. So let me answer your question. Um, if you don't find a lot of resources, uh, number one, you might be on the wrong track. I don't think you are necessarily. Uh, you're not. But if you're not finding a lot of sources, then either you're asking a question that no one else has asked or you're maybe not looking in the right place. Uh, both of those right. could be the case. I don't think it is for yours. I'm not as familiar with the support for dreams and visions, but I know exactly what you're talking about. And um, so in that case, yes, your biblical argument is supposed to be the fundamental argument. You wanna support the biblical argument with theological um, arguments. So if you can make a really well nuanced biblical argument and you don't have as many supporting sources, you should still find some. If you can't find any, I would probably be concerned. But yeah, feel free to nuance your own argument. You, In other words, you don't have to give the standard defense of this established view. On the flip side, if you're not finding any support for your view at all, specifically for dreams and visions, you might need to zoom out and start summarizing um, the cessationist versus continuationist of the gifts themselves as a, as a category. So you right. might have to do one of those two things. Is that helpful? Well, that's, that's what I, I was going to ask as a follow-up, is I'm, I'm coming to that where I... Uh, I want to speak about it more in terms of um, 
the continuation of prophecy in general, but then to nuance the uh, the distinctions of the dreams and visions in particular within my own view, because um, I don't I don't think that they're necessarily an an office, but uh, so I wanted to try to interact that way. So I think I think I understand what you're saying completely. So I appreciate it. Good, glad to help. Let me take John's question. In general, is creativity not a useful element of this type of paper? Essentially, should we just quote stick to the script? Um, that's a great question, and I and I, I I laugh at that question because the way I presented it is as if it is a stick to the script um, assignment. At the most fundamental level, I recommend that you do stick to the script, insofar as you include the right elements. And the reason why I present it in such a way where it's scripted, so to speak, is that from my experience as a writing expert with the Writing Center, students don't, haven't mastered the basic elements. And so here's my recommendation for you. Be creative once you have mastered the scripted elements. So as long as you know, your bare bones skeletal writing, I, are, I recommend first the precision and clarity, make sure that your, your grader professor can find what they're looking for so that they can grade you according to the rubric. Include the essentials, the outline, the skeletal, the script. Include those first and then start playing with it. Once you feel really comfortable that you've included all the elements, then play with it and then add some creative flourishes. That'd be my recommendation. Cool, thanks John. I'll take another question. I had, I came up with a really good one for you, but I lost it. So I'll try to think of it again while I wait for your questions. It has left me. My apologies. Hello. Someone has unmuted themselves. If you have a question, go ahead. I'll speak again for a few moments. Um, as far as writing section one, um, you, when you defend your view, in other words, or that's section, that's section two, my apologies. Maybe that's something to think about. So that's, we're kind of getting beyond the scope of part one, but when you're, when you're moving into summarizing your own view, um, how do you do that in four or so pages? So as you're, as you're working toward part two in the semester, I recommend as you're reading and researching and trying to put your arguments together, you try to uh, find, as you're doing it, more, more and more gradually start to find categories. So remember the thesis statement, I will argue that blah, 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 because these three reasons. Well, you might not have those three reasons when you begin your paper, when you, you know, begin the assignment, but as you do your research and writing and start to develop your own ideas, your, your defense, section two, I, I, I recommend that you start thinking in terms in terms of categories or supporting points because you don't want you don't want to just say, you know, here's 15 reasons why, and it's just a bunch of sentences loosely organized or poorly organized. So you want to start to think, okay, what are some what are two to five, you know, let's just go with three. What are three major ideas? So when you summarize your own view in section two, you have view, you know. I think, or I argue that the reform view of sanctification is the best, or premillennialism is the best, or the continuation or the cessation of the gifts is correct for three reasons. The first reason is this, and then you explain that reason, you defend that reason, biblical support, theological support, historical support. At the end of that subsection, you say, therefore, this view is the most preferred be because and then my, my point I just articulated supports it. And then you go on to point two and do the same thing, and then point three. 
that's a good way to organize. Again, that's kind of scripted, but if you can think in terms of clarity in uh, distinct sections, that will help you organize your thoughts and ultimately better articulate your argument um, in, section, in section two. So hopefully that's helpful. Let's take this question from Greg. Is there a way for distance learners to borrow sources from the library? If so, how is that accomplished? There is. So we work with the library, but not for the library. Uh, what I would recommend is you call the library or, um, or email them, but call them because um, they will send you, as a distance student, you actually have complete access to everything that we have in the library physically. Anything digitally, you can access it right now. But uh, there's a certain way to do it. I don't know how, or I, I can if I, as a student, but as the library worker, that's not me. Um, you request a book. If it's not checked out, you request it. They'll mail it to you for free. And then you have your um, amount of time with it and you mail it back. I think you have to pay to mail it back. I can't remember. But uh, there is a, a system in place and it's um, specifically for distance learners. And so give the library a call. They have a whole process outlined just for that. Hopefully take one or two more brief questions before two. So we have a nice hour long workshop that's recorded for posterity's sake with the relevant questions. Actually, while I'm waiting, I, let me offer a, a word of encouragement. I was helping a distance learner like yourselves um, with a position paper via Zoom. And as we were talking and I was giving him the resources that you're receiving in this workshop and the ones that we've looked at in the PDFs, uh, and he he got really anxious. He said, you know, I'm saying all these names like Wayne Grudem, Greg Allison, Steve Wellum, blah, 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 Fred Sanders, John MacArthur. You know, am I supposed to know all these names? He said, he was getting anxious. Am I supposed to know what premillennialism is? Um, and you know, is this your first semester? Yeah, it is my, it's my first semester. Like, that's okay. My name is Tori, the workshop leader. Um, when I started my master's, I had no um, formal theological education besides just going to church. And I felt the exact same way, overwhelmed. Uh, I heard some students talking about Calvinism and how many points do you believe in, and two and three. I didn't know what they were talking, I didn't know what Calvinism was. I didn't know how many points there were in total. And I felt, should I have gone to Bible college? Am I in the wrong place? Absolutely not. And I say the same to you if you're, if you're worried about that. If you've been in the church for 15 years or or you've, you've gone to a, a non-Christian college or non-Bible college, you are absolutely in the right place. If you want to be trained to minister to the church, to, uh, for the Lord around the world, then uh, you are in the right place getting this degree. You don't have to know everything. And again, if you remember, the purpose of this exercise um, is truly to get you to interact with the sources. So the ideal, the ideal is that by going through the process, whether it's a beautiful process and you had a blast, or if you struggled, by the end of it, you have become more familiar with the different views, the different um, issues involved, the different people involved, and you're a, little, you're a little bit more knowledgeable about this one particular subject than you were before. And really, you might finish your master's or whatever degree you're pursuing, and you might think that you didn't learn all that you um, signed up for, or maybe you don't deserve the master of divinity or master of theological studies or master of arts and counseling. But the, the course program is not going to give you all the information that you'll ever need. Start to think if you're not already. Each assignment is an exercise to get you to learn more and more, to think critically and to get in the sources. And really what we're teaching you through these exercises and assessments, we're teaching you a method a theological method, a Christian method for thinking critically and reflectively. So long term, when you graduate, you will be more uh, prepared, not to you won't know everything, but you'll know how to find the information that you need to find. You'll be more uh, prepared if someone comes up to you for answers, you might say, I don't actually know the answer to that question right now, but let me, let me do some work, let me do some digging. And you have the method, you have the critical and reflective skills to find answers. So start to think in that way. You don't have to know everything. You don't have to be a master um, after you have completed this project. You just have to be a little bit further along than you were before. If you're doing that, you're doing great. 
that completes our workshop. It's about two now. I appreciate all of your questions and feedback. I hope this is helpful to you. I'll end the workshop and the recording. I'll send some follow-up emails to you with these resources. They're also, most of these are available online at our resources page. Uh, we have our the sample theology papers, writing instruction videos, Bible references, and, and more. But I will send these to you via email. And you should be good to go. Thank you all for attending. Take care.